you should just assume that all of these books are five stars. I think only number 10 is a 4.5, so... Hello everybody, it's your girl Jay, and today I am here with my top books of 2022. Yes, you read that and heard that correctly. Top books of 2022. Is it currently August 2023, the time that I'm filming this? Yeah, but it's better late than never, okay? I just haven't been in the mindset to film this video, okay? But now I'm here and I'm ready and we're gonna talk about my top 10 books of 2022. So without further ado, let us get but. started. Coming in at number 10 is The Romance Recipe by Ruby Barrett. This basically follows a restaurant owner named Amy whose restaurant is failing. So she decides that she's going to take a chance on hiring this reality star chef named Sophie. She's hoping that Sophie's connections are going to bring customers, but then sparks fly between them and they start doing the hanky-panky in the kitchen and shit like that. And it's just a grand old time. These two had so much sexual tension the entire time. They're just like staring at each other from across the restaurant and you're like, I know you guys are gonna fuck soon. I just don't know when it's gonna happen. I also just found Sophie's character very relatable. She believes that she is like late to the party in terms of her sexuality. And I just think that a lot of people will be able to see themselves in her. There's a lot of conversation about queer identity and self-acceptance, which I really appreciated. There's also just so many steamy scenes in this, which you girl can't ever get enough steamy scenes. So I was into it. I really like this. And it's my number 10. Coming in at number 9 is A Birthday by Meredith Russo. This is funny because it was my very first book of 2022 when I read it. And I gave it a 5 out of 5 stars. And then it just progressively went down the list until it landed at number 9. I mean, it's still on the list, so clearly I still really liked it. I just think it's funny that it went from 1 to 9. This follows Morgan and Eric, who have been best friends since birth. They actually share the same birthday. And between the ages of 13 and 18, they kind of go through life and the challenges that go along with life together. Morgan's mother recently passed away so they're dealing with that grief and they're also dealing with their own identity and they're finding it very hard to come to terms with that and tell their loved ones, especially Eric, who they are kind of falling for about these struggles and it's kind of that story. I really loved this book. I thought the writing was beautiful and it was a very heart-wrenching story. I really liked how it is dual point of view and you're getting both Morgan and Eric's side of things. And I thought it was really interesting that it was told through snapshots of their birthdays from the ages of 13 to 18. Morgan and Eric's relationship was so complex. It was like a huge emotional roller coaster. And I read it in one sitting because I was so invested in these characters and knowing if they were okay. I just think that the character development in this was so well done. I loved watching them grow and just realize who they are. It was just a very beautiful story, so it's coming in at number nine for me. Coming in at number eight is Melissa Ferguson's Meet Me in the Margins. Think the hating game, but the two characters are the boss, the new owner of a publishing house, and a editor want to be writer, but she works for this publishing house that only likes to publish very intellectual books. They frown upon anything commercial fiction, and she really wants to be a romance writer. And so there's like this hidden little alcove in their office that she likes to go to that nobody really knows about. They call it the Ark Room, which, hello, sounds amazing. But basically, she works on her manuscript in this alcove, and the new boss ends up stumbling across the manuscript, and he starts writing in the margins of it. But she doesn't know that it's him, and he doesn't know that it's her, and he just gives little pointers and, like, tidbits of what they could do to improve the story. And then they end up falling in love, and it's just so cute. Their relationship is so slow burn, so if you're into that, you're gonna love this because, like, it cannot get more slow burn than this. I will say if you're looking for steamy scenes, this does not have it because this, th they kiss once. I'm gonna, th I'm spoiling it for you. They kiss one time and that's it. That's all you're gonna get. But I do think that the main character's chemistry and just overall vibes kind of makes up for that. There's also an amazing female-female friendship between Savannah and her best friend Lila. They are just so supportive of one another. I absolutely adore them, and I would honestly read the book just for them. 
but the romance being really cute also makes for a good story, I guess. Coming in at number seven is Edgewood by Kristen Cicerelli. I freaking loved this book and I did not expect to like it as much, although I love this cover. This follows a 19-year-old named Emmeline Lark who has wanted nothing in her life except for being a singer, so she finally decides that she's going to focus on her career, but then she receives a phone call from her grandfather's assisted living home. He has Alzheimer's and they don't know where he is, so she has to fly home to try to find her grandfather and leave her singing career behind. When she arrives, she discovers that the only thing left behind was this strange orb, which she knows means that he was tithed by the Wood King. So she has to return to Edgewood in order to save her family. While in the woods, Emmeline discovers the curse that is plaguing the people of Edgewood, and she needs to break that curse, and it's kind of the story of that. I think I liked this book so much because of the relationship between Emmeline and her grandfather, who has Alzheimer's, my grandma has Alzheimer's, so I could definitely relate to the things that she was feeling and how difficult she finds it. I really liked the romance in this to a point. I think that the main love interest did a couple of questionable things, but I do like the backstory behind why those things occurred, if that makes any sense. I also really love that this was a standalone fantasy novel. I feel like we don't get a lot of good ones, to be honest, but this one, definitely recommend it. I also just thought the whole concept of music and memory being interwoven in this book was really interesting, so definitely recommend if you haven't read it. I honestly haven't seen a lot of people talk about it. Coming in at so. number six is Lore by Alexander Bracken. This one I read second in the year 2022, and it's still on the list, so apparently I had a really good start to January. January. This one honestly took me by surprise because a lot of people did not like this book, so I think I had very low expectations going into it. It was pitched as Percy Jackson meets The Hunger Games, and I can definitely see those comparisons. It basically takes place after a rebellion many, many years ago where nine Greek gods were abandoned by Zeus and forced to walk Earth as mortals every seven years. Over a period of seven days, the descendants of these gods have to fight in the Agon, which is a fight to the death, essentially. If a god is killed during the Agon, then the person who did the killing takes on the powers of the god for the time being. Lore is the last descendant of the Perseus bloodline, and she has been in hiding for years since the murder of her family. With the start of the next Agon coming and a mysterious goddess shows up at her door asking for help, she decides that she is going to seek revenge on a new god named Wrath. A lot of people say that this book is very info dumpy, which I definitely agree with, but I am a big fan of Greek mythology, so I kind of understood a lot of the myths and gods that were talked about in this book, so I kind of had that background knowledge, so I didn't find it as info dumpy as some people who don't have that knowledge would. I also grew attached to every single one of these characters. I just found them to be so interesting and lovable. I think Lore was the most interesting character because you're getting the backstory of why she didn't want to be in the hunt and why she was avoiding things. She definitely had a very complex past, which I think gave another layer to this story. I'm also just a really big fan of found family, so this was really great for that, in my opinion. I also just think that the banter between all of these characters were so much fun. I really loved seeing all of their relationships grow and become more complex as the story went on. Overall, I was just really surprised at how much I liked this, especially because everybody was so negative towards it when it first came out. I mean, it's number six on my list, so that's pretty high up if you ask me. All right, we are now into our top five, which is very exciting if you ask me. Coming in at number five is The Villa by Rachel Hawkins. I have decided after reading Reckless Girls and that being one of my top books of 2021 and then reading this one and it being one of my top books in 2022, Rachel Hawkins' adult novels are my shit and I will eat them up every single time. This follows Chess and Emily who have been inseparable until their adult life came between them. So when Chess suggests a six week trip to a villa in Italy, Emily jumps on that opportunity to rekindle their friendship. When they arrive, the women discover that in 1974, a group of four famous people stayed in this house and a chain of events led to a famous musician being murdered. As Emily finds inspiration for her next novel, she digs deeper into the history of this house and the villa's secrets start unfolding. I am a sucker for unlikable characters. I will eat that shit up 
every time and none of these characters are likable at all. It's told in alternating timelines from the past and the present. I definitely think that I enjoyed the past chapters more just because we were getting the backstory of what happened to these people in the house. I think the present was more of a just drama between the two girls. Which don't get me wrong, I am a petty bitch so I love the drama. I just think that the mystery aspect was a lot more interesting because the relationships were a lot more complex in the past. The friendship between Emily and Chess was so toxic and I could not get enough of it. I love toxic friendships. Not in real life, but in books, I just, I I get so invested in them because I'm like, wh how, how can you let her or him walk all over you like that? Like, I get so riled up as I am right now. Like, I would have punched Chess in the face so early on in that relationship if I was M. Like, I don't know how she has that self-control because, girl, the things that she does. Whew. I also am just a huge fan of books that include like transcripts or little tidbits of news articles, things like that, I guess mixed media. I find those types of books to be just so engaging. So The Villa is a book that had that, if you couldn't have guessed. So I was into it the entire time. I couldn't get enough of it. It's my number five. Next at number four, I have Please Join Us by Katherine McKenzie. So this follows Nicole, who is on the brink of a crumbling law profession and she receives an invitation from Panthera Leo which is a prestigious group of professional women who all use each other for networking. Her husband Dan warns her that this kind of sounds like a cult and she should beware of these women but Nicole will not listen and she decides to go to this retreat where she joins her pride and the perks start rolling in but then they start asking for favors and she starts realizing that she is a little bit over her head. I love a revenge plot. It is probably one of my favorite tropes especially when it involves women taking down entitled men. I just ugh, I love it. It's told in alternating timelines of the past when Nicole is just entering her pride and kind of learning the ropes, and then the present when she is in the claws of this group. My favorite part was probably learning about all the members of Panthera Leo and their backstory and why they were in the group. I thought it was so interesting. The book is definitely a slow burn, like you really have to piece together everything that is happening, but when it all comes together in the end, it was so satisfying. It is just such a giant web of lies. Like, you know that meme of, like, Sonny in Philadelphia where he, like, has all of the pins in the board and he, like, looks insane? That's what this book was and it was so good. I just had so much fun reading this book. It was number one for quite a while, but it kind of got beaten out by a couple other books, clearly, since it's my number four, but still, really good thriller. Definitely recommend. Next up, coming at my number three is Delilah Green Doesn't Care by Ashley Herring Blake. I freaking love this book solely for Delilah. I don't know if I want to be her or date her. I am just in love with this woman. She is just so multi-layered and spunky. I couldn't get enough of her. I also really liked Claire, who is the love interest. I really loved her journey of trying to raise a child by herself, but then the dad coming back into the picture, and then she's also trying to juggle the budding romance between herself and Delilah. I just thought it was so well done. I guess I should probably explain what the book is about. It essentially follows Delilah Green, who is hired by her stepsister, Astrid, to be the wedding photographer. This means she has to return to her hometown of Bright Falls, which she has sworn to never return to. She has the plan to get in and out as quickly as possible, but then she meets one of the bridesmaids, Claire, and she starts to fall for her and it is just so adorable. I just thought the chemistry between Delilah and Claire was off the charts. I could not get enough of these two together. Like, they were just chef's kiss. I also just really liked the complex relationship between Astrid and Delilah. We get a lot of backstory and I thought it was really interesting how the two characters saw the things that went on in their relationship so differently even though it was the same situation. There's also just a lot of petty drama between the bride and the bridesmaids which I'm a big fan of. They try to hijack the wedding and I think that it caused so much drama which made a very interesting side plot to the story. 
I've still yet to read the companion novels of this, which is Blasphemy, so I really do need to get my hands on them. I obviously gave it a 5 out of 5 stars. It is number 3 on the list, but you should read it if you haven't, which you probably have because everybody and their mother has read this novel. Coming in at number 2 is Dreams Lie Beneath by Rebecca Ross. I really love Rebecca Ross's writing. This one I definitely think is one of her underrated novels. I have never seen anybody talk about it, but when I read it, I was obsessed. This takes place in the realm of Ezinor, where Clementine Madigan lives. There's a plague that comes down from the mountains that essentially causes nightmares to come to life. Clementine's father is the territory warden, which means that he has the ability to banish these nightmares every new moon. Clementine has been training her entire life to take over her father's position, but then two magicians show up and challenge her father for the position and that causes her to have a massive loss and kind of launch her into a century-old battle. I was instantly drawn into this book and the magic system and the complex relationships. Like I've said, I am a huge sucker for a revenge plotline and Clementine is seeking revenge. I mean, it is thrown out the window fairly quickly for, um, romance that ensues, but I was here for it when it was lasting. Another one of my favorite tropes is enemies to lovers, especially when it's unknown enemies to lovers. So Pelin, one of the magicians, has no idea how much Clementine hates him, and he thinks that they're all hunky-dory, and she's like, bitch, I'm gonna fucking kill ya, and then she falls in love with him, and I just... Oh. I can't get enough of it. I didn't think that I was going to like this as much as I did because it seems like such a simple story at the beginning, but as you keep reading, it becomes so multi-layered and complex. Like, I was sitting there like, wait, what? This is this and this is that and what? Like, by the end of it, my jaw was on the floor. There's also a, like, fairy tale kind of interwoven into this book, which I love fairy tales, so I just found the whole concept of the book to be very interesting. I just think that the overall story was so expertly written, I could not get enough of it. I desperately need another book in this world with these characters because I'm not done with them. Like, I'm sorry, Rebecca, like, you need to write me another one of these because I love them. I love these characters. And then, coming in at my number one spot is the entire Mindfuck series by S.T. Abbey. I don't care that I'm supposed to pick one of them. I love this entire series. Like, you can't just pick one. It is a series and they have to be grouped together. If you live under a rock and don't know what this series is about, it essentially follows a female serial killer who is seeking revenge for something that happened in her past, and she starts dating the FBI agent that is assigned to her case. It gives such female Dexter vibes, and Dexter was one of my favorite TV shows when it was on. I heard about this book, and I instantly knew that I needed to read it, and I was going to be obsessed with it, and I was not wrong. It progressively got better and better as I kept reading the books. There's five of them in total. I wish there was more, or like give me a TV show or a movie based off of these characters because I am obsessed. This series definitely gets darker and darker as you read. Like, that final book is a lot, but I ate that shit up. Oh, again, revenge plot. I love it. Serial killers, one of my favorite buzzwords. Like, this series was written for me. Each of the books also left on on giant cliffhangers, so you couldn't help but needing to immediately pick up the next book because the cliffhangers were always insane. I just think that the entire series was wrapped up so nicely, like, everything was tied up so perfectly, I had no unanswered questions left. I will say that I do think that the ending was a little bit rushed, like, I wish that it had been laid out a little bit more, but I had so much fun reading this series that I'm gonna let it slide, and I'm just gonna slap a big five stars, favorite book of the year, favorite series of the year, like, it was so fucking good, so. Alright, everybody, so those were my top ten books of 2022, coming at ya, August 2023. I'm not sorry, okay? You at least got them. Th let me know down below if you have read any of these books and what you thought of them, and I will see you all in my next video. Goodbye!